Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 230. This week, again in conjunction with taking questions from two weeks worth of videos to catch up a little bit, the questions are taken from guides 272 and 273 which are HMS Duke of Wellington and USS Iowa BB4 with the accompanying Wednesday videos on the raid on Saint-Nazaire and steam boilers in the 1900s, the crossover between cars and ships, with a question or two also thrown in from the Friday video on why you don't see 1v1 ship versus ship videos on the channel anymore. Grimtooth asks, how does breaking up a ship for scrap work? Is it as simple as ripping out everything from the inside and then cutting up whatever's left into lumps to be melted down, or is there more to it? It was a little bit more complicated than that. Now, the Navy in question would usually try and recover some of the most valuable stuff, either for reuse or resale themselves, before they sold what was left of the ship for scrap. And the last crew that left a ship, knowing it was going to the breaker's yard, would often make off with quite a fair bit of stuff as well. However... Even with both of those forces acting on them, there was no way you were going to get everything. So the first thing that the scrappers would do would make a thorough inspection of the ship to see what else in terms of particularly valuable metals there was to recover. And some elements would just be not accessible to somebody who was trying to strip out a ship while it was still whole, whereas obviously the breakers can, as the name suggests, break things up quite a bit more. So copper cabling in wires, brass um, were the two main things that would be recovered. Occasionally bronze fittings, although during the main period when we're looking at iron and steel warships it would mostly be brass. Obviously when you're looking at wooden warships there might be copper nails involved, um, possibly copper sheeting if the navy in question hadn't taken that off, although it's probably fairly likely that they would have done. And then there's individual items that, again, would have been left with the ship but might still be valuable. So perhaps things like voice pipes. You know, you're not going to recover all of the piping, but the end and beginning points of the voice pipes, the actual bits you speak into, those of themselves might be relatively valuable because if you can strip out enough of them, then you have a full second-hand set that if another ship is going to be built and the voice pipe setup is in reasonable condition, you can then offer those items as a discounted sale, but something you still make a fair profit on when you sell it on to someone who's building the new vessel, whatever that might happen to be. And similarly with you know lights, dials, gauges, and all that kind of stuff, assuming you weren't just recovering it for the scrap value of the metal that they were made up of. And then, as you can see here, with HMS King George V being broken up in the 50s, you would have to go full-on industrial wrecking ball to tear apart the ship from the top down in order to get at the bulk of the steel. Now, most of that steel would just be sold on as scrap for reuse, but even with that said, and also to a certain degree, depending on which ship you were breaking up, because, you know, an early steel or iron ship would mostly just be scrap, if you were breaking up let's say, a World War II battleship where on the British ship a significant amount of the structure might have, have ducal steel in it, or if it was something like USS Washington or USS South Dakota might have a fair amount of STS steel in it, those higher quality steels would potentially be able to be sold on a scrap, but much higher quality scrap steel or individual pieces might have uh, better selling points as whole parts so some parts of ship armor whether that be cruisers or battleships have had second lives as radiation shielding or as the backstops to rifle ranges and things like that so you'd be identifying the more valuable steels within the ship and trying to determine who will pay a premium for that good quality steel which you would have to separate out from the general quality steel and then you've got the bulk steel, which you just then obviously, as I said, break up and sell on for scrap. And as you get further and further down in the ship, you would come across basically a second wave of valuable items that could be recovered that couldn't otherwise be recovered from the ship when it was in even a vaguely intact state earlier on in the scrapping process. So that might be, say, bilge pumps or uh, hatch covers and hatches, that kind of thing. Again, some of which may just be useful for as 
bulk scrap items, but as individual ship fittings might well be valuable if there's a shipbuilding trade nearby where they can be repurposed. Josh Thomas Moore asks, what was the Yamato equivalent for the Age of Sail, Ironclads and Pre-Dreadnoughts, i.e. the pinnacle of these types of ships before those types died off? It's somewhat difficult to define in all three cases because, for one thing, usually people didn't go in for a massive jump the way that the Yamatos jumped over the treaty battleships, in, you know, almost double the displacement. And also because in Age of Sail, Ironclads and Pre-Dreadnoughts, one bled into the other, and then obviously the Dreadnoughts um, were kind of followed on from the Pre-Dreadnoughts, it becomes very difficult sometimes when you look at the halfway house designs to try and say, okay, exactly where do you put the cutoff? Because, you know, with something like a Dreadnought, HMS Dreadnought herself, or the pre-Dreadnought's HMS Majestic, or an Ironclad like Warrior, it is easy to define this is the start of the new generation, but where the last of the classic old generation stops and you enter the sort of the grey area of the hybrids, that's somewhat harder to pin down. So you could really maybe look at equivalent impact at the time, but for the Age of Sail, you might look at something like Sovereign of the Seas, but then Sovereign of the Seas wasn't the pinnacle of the large ship of the line before dying out. You know, she was in some ways the progenitor of the first rate ship of the line but she was considerably larger than almost anything else around at the time. If you want to look towards the end period, then you have, again, as I said, these difficult issues with the, the crossover and the hybrids, because you've got, for example, HMS Victoria, which you can see here. By displacement, that was the largest wooden warship to reach service. She had a slightly larger half-sister, which never was actually fully commissioned, but at the same time, as compared to other ships of the line, she has iron reinforcement, which comes along later, so she's not a fully wooden warship. And she also has a screw engine. You can't see that here because the funnel's been collapsed. She's running under sails, but she is a hybrid steam and sail vessel. And although her displacement is quite significant at just a hair under 7,000 tons, it's not anywhere close to as big a jump over other large ships of the line of the period compared to how Yamato jumped over the treaty battleships. For example, um, the French Bretagne, which was one of the very larger ships of the line prior to the launch of Victoria, was also very close to her in displacement. And then when you get to the latter part of the Ironclad era, you have a ship like Italia, which is incredibly heavily armed, very large and relatively fast for her time. Obviously, slightly different take on armour. But you also have Royal Sovereign, which is an interesting one because Royal Sovereign has lots of elements of ironclads that came before her, but also some elements of the pre-dreadnoughts which would succeed her. And to the extent that some historians would put Royal Sovereign as the first of the pre-dreadnoughts instead of the Majestics. But others, myself included to be fair, would tend to place Royal Sovereign as either the last of the Ironclads or a stepping stone hybrid between the last true Ironclads, which in the Royal Navy would be the Victoria class, uh, not to be confused with the previous uh, wooden Victoria, and the Trafalgar Dash Admiral class, and then the Majestics. But even then, the Royal Sovereigns and the Italia, they don't come close to outmassing and outgunning their predecessors to the same degree that the Yamatos do, even though they are pretty large and pretty powerful. And then when you get to the at last of the pre-dreadnoughts, you have a whole raft of designs, obviously, which most people refer to as semi-dreadnoughts. And again, it's a question of they are in some ways the ultimate expression of the pre-dreadnought, but they are also sometimes classed as semi-dreadnoughts because they are, to a certain extent, departing from that paradigm and heading off in, in the direction that you would later see with the full-on dreadnoughts. Or, in the case of most of the semi-dreadnoughts, you would actually see earlier because the dreadnought revolution actually overtakes the semi-dreadnoughts and the vast majority of them, for various reasons, are finished after dreadnoughts have entered service. 
So you look at the Dantons, the Lord Nelsons and the Satsumas and by sheer firepower, if you just look on paper values, then probably the Satsumas are the ultimate expression of the pre-dreadnought. And technically speaking, at least one of the two is also the fastest. But in terms of the best protection, which obviously Yamato had really heavy armor as well, that would be the Lord Nelsons. But in terms of actual impact in service, i.e., you know, having an effect on the world around them, it would be the Dantons and so on and so on and so forth. So you could classify any one of those as the Yamato of the pre-dreadnoughts with the obviously the complication that although all th three of those ships or classes significantly outmass their predecessors especially the Satsumas and the Dantons again they're not you know doubling the previous vessels displacement and they're certainly not doubling the overall firepower although their increased secondary batteries are considerably more powerful. Brendan Boersdorf asks I've seen numerous plans and ideas for French and American armoured cruiser upgrade programs, ranging from total rebuilds to engine and gun replacements. What would be your ideal armoured cruiser upgrade program, and which of any armoured cruiser available, even sunken vessels, would you choose to upgrade? Well, it depends just how much money you have, because to upgrade an armoured cruiser, presumably in the interwar period, to be competitive with the new heavy cruisers, as they would later come to be known, that are being produced, would be quite the significant task because, of course, the new ships are capable of 30 plus knots. Uh, they're armed with anything from 8 to 10 8 inch guns, depending on the ship in question. Their only real deficit compared to the armored cruisers is the armor. Um, heavy cruisers, generally speaking, not having anywhere close to the same level of protection that the armoured cruisers did, at least the last generations of them. But if you're therefore going to upgrade an armoured cruiser, you want to pick one of the light latest ones, one of the most recent ones, because that will be the shortest bridge to gap. And also, as is inevitable with most things, the last generations of armoured cruisers did tend to be somewhat larger, which gives you more space to play with and in theory would give you something of an inherent advantage over treaty cruisers which are of course in theory at least not looking at you japan or italy or germany restricted to about 10,000 tons but assuming that i have infinite money and i can choose any ship it would be a very difficult choice for me between sms blucher and the russian armored cruiser rurik which is the uh, guest ship for the picture you can see now the reason for this is that they are, broadly speaking, about the same displacement, 15 to 16,000 tons normal load. And size-wise, there isn't a huge amount in it either. They're almost exactly the same length. Um, Blucher is slightly beamier, uh, but Rurik has a slightly shallower draft. Now, on paper, you might think, well, Blucher was almost a battle cruiser so surely she should be the choice and yeah i would agree um blucher is certainly the faster vessel by over four knots so getting a ship that's designed for 25 26 knots up to 30 knots is going to be a lot less of an ask than getting a ship that was designed for 21 knots up to the same speed albeit that uh, rurik used vertical triple expansion engines so uh, it, improving those to geared turbines would probably result in quite the significant power boost but you know, let's not kid ourselves either of those ships would require massive rebuilds to have an ideal conversion and this is where the one element with rurik comes in in that her main armament yes she has twin eight inch guns on the side as you can see in turrets but she has twin 10 inch guns fore and aft and in my ideal armored cruiser reconfiguration obviously you'd be installing modern small tube boilers with geared turbines which would significantly reduce the amount of machinery space you need even if you're boosting the speed at the same time which would also reduce the number of funnels and as you can see there is quite the distance between the aftmost turret of Rurik and the funnels which indicate where the boiler spaces are obviously there's also engine spaces to take into account and you can see a similar thing with Blucher. However, because Rurik has twin 10-inch, then 
broadly speaking, are following the rule of thumb of drop a gun and go up two inches for refits or redesigns, you can also reverse that and say, well, it would be possible perhaps to replace Rurik's twin tens with triple eights. Now that already gives you six eight inch guns on the center line, assuming that no, sort of disregarding the wing turrets. Now, I personally would be tempted to then remove the casement battery entirely, remove the wing turrets, and then at approximately the position where the aft wing turrets are now, the easiest thing, I think, all told, would then be to move those uh, to the center line as another triple eight. So you would have a broadside of nine eight inch guns in three triple turrets with a slightly sort of Königsberg Leipzig style two aft and one forward which leaves the sides now able to be equipped with dual purpose anti -aircraft, heavy anti-aircraft guns. Now you can do the same thing roughly speaking with Blucher in fact thanks to the fact that she uses turbines already uh, the machinery space is a bit more compact you could probably make an argument for even fitting four triples albeit you'd either have to significantly shift the superstructure back to fit a super firing triple forward so two triples at either end or possibly have three triples in a kind of semi stack semi in line at the back however the the only fly in that ointment is that Blucher's fore and aft guns as well as her side guns are all twin 8.2 inch which would mean you'd have to do significantly more work to those initial fore and aft barbettes to expand them and basically replace them to take triple eights which theoretically actually would make it slightly more expensive and more difficult to convert Blucher into a 30 knot heavily armored heavy cruiser type now either of these conversions is going to be insanely ridiculously expensive and completely change the layout of the ships and as I said Blucher does have the advantage that you wouldn't have to do as much work to her machinery spaces to get her up to 30 knots so it's a little bit of a coin toss, I think, because there are ad advantages and disadvantages in trying to turn either Blucher or, or Rurik into 30-knot ships with 9 or 12  8-inch uh, guns. Dejan Gabrovsek asks, How good was visibility from the conning tower of a King George V or a Queen Elizabeth? As far as I know, it was quite bad from the Iowa-class battleships. It's true, if you've ever been aboard an Iowa-class battleship and you will have seen a little bit of that from the USS New Jersey video that came out recently, um, when you look at the conning tower part, that is, the viewing slits there are very small and the entire conning tower, at least at the level that I was at, is contained within a, a wider bridge structure. Now, there is a level above, which isn't so constrained, but even so, the viewing slits are relatively few and far between. So, yeah, the view's not brilliant. However, on Warspite or Queen Elizabeth or Valiant, the refit QEs, or King George V, which I think is what the question is getting at, the British Queen Anne's mansion-style superstructures, they don't have a conning tower as such. They do technically have some kind of vaguely armoured steering position, um, and obviously multiple redundant backups as well elsewhere in the ship, but the steering position, which if you were going to squint hard enough, you could call a conning tower on a King George V or on a refit QE, it, as you can see in this photo, if you look, you can see the compass platform uh, right at the top front of the bridge superstructure. Then you've got the Admiral's Bridge with the nice windows and the ship's crest just below it. And then as that kind of tucks back in, you can see above the deck where there's regular portholes, or um, not scuttles because they're not in the hull, you can see there's this little line of tiny slits that is actually an armoured steering position. It's not a conning tower in the traditional sense. It's not separate from the superstructure. It's not a tower. Um, and it's definitely not very heavily protected. It's basically got splinter-destroyer proof, maybe light cruiser long distance proof armour in about three inches or so. But as you can see, the vision slits, although they're not particularly tall, they are relatively wide and they are relatively continuous. And of course, the entire location is a little bit larger than a traditional conning tower on most vessels. So the visibility would be somewhat better 
because you've got more horizontal view distance and less intervening armor, but not tremendously better because you're still going to be incredibly restricted as compared to being out on an open bridge or compass platform. And of course, that's why it was rarely, if ever, actually used. And of course, it does have to be emphasized you can afford that kind of visibility through three inch armor because the impact of a four or five inch, maybe six inch shell is going to be considerably less than the impact of a 14, 15, 16 inch shell, which the conning tower, quote unquote, armor of a King George V is likely to repel the, the former and the conning tower of an Iowa, in theory at least, should repel the latter. With the heavier armoured conning towers, you want the absolute minimum vision slits that you can get away with, hence why there's also a periscope in the Iowa class's conning tower, because, well, any small gap is open to exploitation by the blast and shrapnel effects, etc., of a very heavy shell, whereas when you're looking at three-inch armour, if you get hit by a battleship-grade shell, it really doesn't matter at all. Knight 6831 asks, Why do myths about small tube boilers still persist? And with regards to Hood, I saw it said that her boilers needed retubing, but just how bad does the piping need to be to require that? Well, I'm not too sure about myths of small tube boilers. Um, I perhaps blissfully haven't come across too many, but maybe someone can let us know some uh, erroneous things that have been stated about them in the past in the comments below. Uh, but with regards to Hood, and her boilers needing retubing, or the ship just needing reboiling, boilering generally. That, as of World War II, was near enough accurate, but that is just a function of a ship that's been around a really, really long time. As a general rule of thumb, something I've mentioned on previous dry docks, is that if you're talking at least about a capital ship that's in relatively frequent use you need to re-engine and re-boiler the ship roughly once every couple of decades. Now, that is slightly obscured by the fact that an awful lot of ships that existed in the time period of steam turbines and boilers didn't actually reach 20 years, so that was never a problem for them. And when you get to something like the Iowa's it gets a little bit more complicated again because, of course, they existed through the Cold War and into the modern era when different fuel formulations and more modern forms of treatment for the boilers existed, which theoretically extend their lifespan. And we're talking about 20 years of active service. The Iowas, although they've been around for much, much longer than that, the actual active service where their boilers have been being used and have been being worn, etc., is scattered around in relatively small pockets along that timeline. But with Hood, not only had she been slightly more heavily used than was typical for an interwar capital ship, but by the start of World War II, she was pretty much near enough bang on 20 years old uh, in terms of active service life, which meant that her boilers did really need either complete replacement or at the very least retubing. Because as you can see here, those tubes this is Curacao, this isn't Hood, but you can get the general point. The tubes are not something that you can easily access to clean. And one small disadvantage of small tube boilers is, of course, that if you do get accretions and stuff building up in them, then proportionally they take up a lot more space and volume within the tube as compared to larger tube boilers. So, what, well, these are probably an inch, inch and a half across. So if you get a quarter inch of encrustation on them then that's going to occupy far more of the tube's volume and therefore restrict the flow a lot more than a larger tube boiler where that same quarter inch would be a much smaller proportion of the overall internal volume or cross-sectional area plus as i said you know general wear and tear and if you don't do that, then eventually you'll have lower power outputs because the tubes themselves won't be as efficient. Um, cleaning can only do so much. You've also got oxidation. You've also got weakening of the tubes themselves. So you might only be able to run them at certain pressures. They might only be able to take certain pressures. You might have tubes bursting. And even if none of that happens, then, as I said, just the oxidation and the bits and pieces that build up that you can't actually clean will end up resulting in a lower thermal transmission effectiveness.
Now in wartime, when you spend time at higher speeds and at pressure a lot more than you do it at peacetime, that massively increases the wear out on boilers. So you have some ships in World War II that are near enough fresh off the factory production line. You know, they're kind of launched in the late 1930s. And by the end of the war, they need reboilering <laughs> or at least retubing. Sean O'Brien asks, what is the benefit of a fire tube boiler and why did it remain the primary type for locomotives, traction engines, steam wagons, etc.? Was it a maintenance issue or does the greater volume of water kept ready to flash into steam serve as a power reserve to meet sudden demands which the firebox couldn't supply? So the fire tube boiler is for shipping an inferior solution to the water tube boiler, which is why it was succeeded by the water tube boiler. However, when you look at the demands of locomotives, you say traction engine steam wagons, basically land-based, self-propelled, boiler-driven steam vehicles, the fire tube boiler is a significantly less complex structure, which means it's cheaper to build, um, it's cheaper to operate in in terms of maintenance, because again, less complexity. Um, it's relatively easy to maintain because once the fire's out and it's cooled down enough generally it's just a straight run through the tubes which allows you to you know clean and maintain them a lot easier than with a, a water tube boiler where there's a lot of draining going on if you're trying to get at them also um compared with a water tube boiler obviously a water tube boiler if you have contaminants in the water will build up scale which is a lot harder to displace than soot which will build up in a fire tube boiler's tubes and they're pretty simple to operate in comparison to a water tube boiler what a water tube boiler has as an advantage over the fire tube boilers um, um apart from anything else there are a few other advantages but the main thing is that water tube boilers can operate at a much much higher temperature and pressure which means you can get significantly more power output out of them which of course for ships means that they can go significantly faster now the thing is you could in theory stick a water tube boiler in a land-based vehicle and you would be able to operate it with higher pressure and higher um, power output as a result and they did try this a few times however there are some inherent disadvantages to that because well for one thing the boilers on ships are at a whole different scale usually so there's different efficiencies involved but also when they tried as far as i'm aware to run uh, water tube high pressure boilers on steam engines apart from the additional complexity and cost it was generally found that there wasn't a huge amount of benefit involved you just you know you had all this extra power at your disposal but not really any real way to exploit it because if you put huge amounts of additional pressure into the wheels of a steam train for example you'd probably break something and if you didn't break something bearing in mind it's just a steel on steel contact you just end up spinning the wheels which isn't good for anybody so there wasn't the need for the additional cost and complexity of the water tube boiler because the benefit that that offered wasn't really applicable to the relatively speaking limited demands of land-based steam-powered vehicles Joe Svoboda asks, I'm listening to Post Captain, part of the Aubrey Mortorin series, and just finished the Indiaman versus French privateer encounter. How likely were East Indiamen to sail alone during the Napoleonic era? Patrick O'Brien once stated he got most of his sea at sea plots from Royal Navy archives. It depends on the exact time period within the Napoleonic Wars and on the ship, because... East Indiaman is it's a generic term. It technically is to any ship chartered by the East India Company. could also sometimes apply to any ship that's on the India trade. But if we're talking about the classic East Indiaman, the big cargo carrying ships with armament as built or chartered by the East India Company, mostly the British East India Company, but also the Dutch, etc., etc., they could sail in convoys, especially some of the smaller ones. And if it was known that an enemy fleet was going to be at sea, then they, even the bigger ones would group up into convoys. But those convoys could be very large, you know, 
50, 100, 200 ships strong, not just East Indiamen, but a bunch of other merchants as well. Or they could be relatively small, you know, four or five ships strong. It would be enough to see off the occasional marauding frigate. But the larger East Indiamen would also relatively frequently sail alone because most privateers were not big enough and well-armed enough to take on one of the bigger East Indiamen with their guns. Okay, even a large East Indiaman probably wouldn't stand a tremendous chance against a marauding fifth rate that was well crewed, but on most of the trade routes that the East Indiaman operated on, those were relatively rare, and if word that one was present or a squadron got around, then of course they'd form up into convoys. But it was much more efficient for them to sail when their masters decided they wanted to sail. And of course you don't have to sail in convoy the entire route. You might, for example, sail in a convoy to get past France and then once you get out into the mid-Atlantic or the southern Atlantic, break off and do your own thing. And so on and so on and so forth. So the idea of coming across a mid to large sized East Indiaman sailing alone during the Napoleonic era, that's perfectly reasonable uh, and would be not uncommon by a long shot. Stalking Tiger 777 asks, I have a question about something a former Navy guy told me a couple of years back. He mentioned that part of the reason the I was brought back was because they could take period anti-ship missiles, whereas modern cruisers and destroyers couldn't. Is this true? Supposedly an Iowa was projected to be able to take several hits to its upper works and shrug off hits to its belt from period missiles. I know this is past the period covered in the channel, um, but I was curious. As he said, you know, it's well outside the channel's time period, so I can't guarantee the accuracy of any of this. But from what my limited reading suggests, I mean, apart from anything, the Iowas are just that much larger. They're much more massive in all senses than pretty much anything that's not an aircraft carrier, so they would take more hits to put down than a Ticonderoga or an Ali Burke. Then when you look at the armour, now if this was evaluating against something like uh, an Exocet or a Sea Eagle or even a Harpoon, then yeah, it I, I would be very confident in making those assessments. However, a lot of the Russian missiles tend to be quite big and quite fast for the most part. Um, now, could an Iowa class take a Russian anti-shipping missile to the belt armor? Again, not, not the scope of the channel. Um, I don't know. Some of the earlier ones... Sure, maybe they might, you know, similar to a giant flying high explosive shell, they might hit the outer plating, um, which is not ignoring on the diagram. Ignore the fact it says decapping plate. That's old news. That's not actually real. Well, the plate is there, but it doesn't actually function as decapping plate. But never mind. But for the purposes of the missile, the missile hitting that might initiate the fuse and certainly might cause it to break up and then all the intermediate structure, etc., so, you know, an older supersonic, low supersonic anti-shipping missile that plasters itself into the belt armor, the belt might resist it. The belt might, would even if it's penetrated, would certainly reduce the amount of damage that gets further into the ship. Um, if you've got a pop-up attack scheme, then you might have a similar thing where the bomb deck right at the top might initiate and or break up the missile, which might then either splash off the armor deck or the armor deck, again, would reduce the amount of internal damage done to the citadel of the ship compared to a more modern vessel that basically doesn't really have any armor, where the missile might well get deep into the heart of the ship before any kind of significant breakup or fuse initiation occurs. How that would translate into the later, you know, big thousand kilo warheaded uh, Mach 4 Plus missiles, I don't know. Um, again almost certainly would survive significantly better than the unarmoured uh, unarmored regular warships of the, the general Cold War period. Um, and if the missiles do go after the upper works, well, you know, the, yeah, the battleship's designed to withstand bombardment by shells in that area and re reasonably enough walk it off. So yeah, hits to the upper works, that should be perfectly fine. 
it's not going to compromise the ship's ability to fight because the citadel wouldn't be compromised but as i said it would my knowledge of that period and how the iOS would stand up would be very sketchy it would depend very much on what missiles you were launching against the iowa and where they hit and how they hit because it could be anything from yeah there's a slight hole in our side plating or there's a annoying hole in our upper works let's carry on all the way through to uh, you know the a hypersonic missile might just pop straight through who knows <laughs> um without revealing secrets because i'm fairly sure some information about that is still classified if anybody knows definitively more about that please feel free to chime in in the comments below and josh thomas moore asks i remember reading there was a royal navy rating who also got a victoria cross during the san nazaire raid for performing a similar act to sergeant durant is this true and if so could you please name him for us so there are five victoria crosses awarded for the san nazaire raid three of which are to officers uh, then, of course, you have Durant, which by process of elimination would mean that the individual you're referring to is Able Seaman, Wilfred, uh, Able Seaman William Alfred Savage. And the Gazette citation for his Victoria Cross reads, uh, For great gallantry, skill and devotion to duty as gun layer of the pom-pom in a motor gunboat in the San Nazaire raid, completely exposed and under heavy fire, he engaged positions ashore with cool and steady accuracy. On the way out of the harbour, he kept up the same vigorous and accurate fire against the attacking ships until he was killed at his gun. This Victoria Cross is awarded in recognition not only of the gallantry and devotion of, to duty of Abel Seaman Savage, but also of the valour shown by many others unnamed in motor launches, motor gunboats and motor torpedo boats who gallantly carried out their duty in entirely exposed positions against enemy fire at very close range. He was stationed aboard MGB-314 and was age 29 when he died. So, yes, that would be um, the name and the fact that, yes, it's a, a true account, although of able seamen as opposed to rating. But nonetheless, uh, there is also a book about his life called From Smethic to San Nazaire, The Life of Bill Savage, V.C., and although there are some people on Amazon who appear to be wanting to charge absolutely extortionate prices for it, uh, you can actually find it at the Smethic Heritage Centre website. So that's uh, smethic.org.uk. For those of you not in the UK or not used to how we pronounce things, well, at least how things are pronounced in certain regions of the UK, uh, that's S-M-E-T-H-W-I-C-K.org.uk. Uh, they're the actual publishers of it and... It contains uh, additional details and accounts of exactly what happened that day uh, and how Abel Seaman Savage met his end. Um, I've ordered a copy. Uh, it's only £8 plus shipping uh, or convert local converted currency. So if you'd like a copy, I would highly encourage you to go and check it out. And if you have issues, I don't know if, what their policy is on overseas shipping, but if you do have issues on overseas shipping, uh, then just drop me an email and I'm sure we can work something out. Stephen Rickstrew, in a comment on the San Nazaire video, said, One of the few raids that came close to this is the un unbelievably daring solo attack by the Beaufort torpedo bomber on Gneisenau at Brest by Flight Officer Campbell and crew. Campbell seems to be a name that menaced the Kriegsmarine repeatedly. Yeah, it's somewhat underappreciated just what a tricky situation Campbell found himself in because it was thought that Gneisenau was protected by torpedo nets. Um, so there was supposed to be both equipped with bombs to blow up the torpedo nets first. They got stuck on the airfield because it got very wet and muddy. Um, and then between mist and weather and various other situations, the Beauforts, I think three, which were assigned to be the actual torpedo strike force, were separated. So Campbell shows up, there's no uh, bombers to blow up any torpedo nets that may or may not have been there. Um, and what you might also not recognise is that Gneisenau was moored inside the mole of Brest Harbour. So you can't just do a nice long run in, drop a torpedo and skedaddle. Um, if you drop it uh, a fair distance off, it's a stationary target. The torpedo might physically be able to run that distance, but it will just slam into the mole. So you've got to get right close and personal to drop this thing. And the Beaufort, with the best will in the world, it's a decent enough torpedo bomber to go hunting random ships at sea in. 
But as you can probably guess from this, it's not exactly the world's most agile of aircraft. It's a three-man, twin-engined, relatively heavy torpedo bomber. And you're flying over Brest, which the RF has been trying to turn into a moonscape and the Germans have been trying to turn into a collection of every single anti-aircraft gun in Western France. Plus, of course, you know the German ships present in harbour have their own anti-aircraft defences. And he's got to fly low, close and relatively slow in all of this. Believe it or not, if Flight Officer Campbell earns his Victoria Cross for actually managing to pull this off and hitting Ganeisen now so hard with the torpedo that she's actually in very, very near danger of sinking. If she was hit at sea and she took the flooding that she did in harbour, she may well have gone down to a single torpedo hit, which would have been an interesting end to her career. But... Whereas with normal torpedo attacks, you can escape by just upgunning the engine and powering on out of there at low altitude, which makes you somewhat harder to hit. Unfortunately, as you can possibly discern with this artwork, the landscape immediately afterwards is actually quite hilly and ridged, which meant that the Beaufort had to then pull up. And unfortunately, that's where Flight Officer Campbell lost his life, because as he pulled up, it was a choice to either do that or crash, but of course that meant he was a much easier target for a much broader range of anti-aircraft guns, and the aircraft was hit and, and shot down. But that whole saga has been commemorated relatively recently, I think a couple of years ago when this artwork was released, which is the box cover artwork on the Airfix model for the Beaufort. Alec Ruby asks, It was once said that if Germany had had the 300 subs the Navy wanted before the war, they would have sufficiently blockaded the UK enough to either force a white peace or have them surrender. Would you agree with this statement, and do you think it would have really worked out? And secondly, could Germany have made that many subs if they didn't build surface raiders and battleships, but they did build the Hipper class? Well, the Deutschlands don't make either here nor there an issue because they're built back in the 20s when the Germans aren't building submarines anyway, so whether or not you have the Deutschlands as tonnage really makes zero impact on U-boat building. If you didn't build the Scharnhorst and the Bismarck, that would have saved resources and money, which could go towards building U-boats to be sure, but it's not a kind of a straight substitution of, you know, if we don't build 100 hell for many thousand tons of shipping probably roughly speaking uh what 140 150,000 tons of shipping that doesn't translate into being able to build 150 to 200 additional u-boats because whilst steel wise you might physically have that much steel around manufacturing the steel for the bulkheads of a battleship is a very different process to making the pressure hull of a u-boat and of course the forges that are making big, thick sheets of plate armour for a battleship, well, U-boats are not exactly known for having massive amounts of thick plate armour. And although a battleship might have multiple boilers or uh, for its engines and obviously um, big turbines and everything, there's a l limited number of them. Whereas with the U-boats, you have to manufacture hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of, well, for that many U-boats, thousands of batteries which are generally not found on battleships of the period and each of those u-boats needs a set of electric motors and a set of diesel motors so the actual amount either by number or by tonnage of drive systems is going to be massively in excess of what you'd actually need for the Scharnhorst and the Bismarcks for example so you can't you go okay well we will sacrifice x hundred thousand tons of battleships in exchange for y hundred number of u-boats um for the same amount of money and industrial resource development yes you would be able to build more u-boats although again you know you've still got to have the infrastructure and dockyard space to construct them because well building a single u-boat on a slipway design for a battleship is going to be a hilariously inefficient waste of time um but you know, hand-waving all that aside, to a certain degree, yes, you could build an arbitrarily larger number of U-boats, maybe 40, 60, 80, something in that, that region, for the resources and money that you otherwise have spent on the battleships. However, um, saying if they'd had 
300 U-boats at the beginning of the war they could have blockaded the UK is what I call a first order alternate history approximation and it's usually one of the least helpful because it's very unrealistic because even if you come up with some scenario where it's plausible for the Germans to have built 300 U-boats and it is possible to do so that set then the reason I call it first order is because you're just changing one thing and you're assuming that the British have done nothing in response to this which is fundamentally not the case you know if the Germans aren't building the Scharnhorst and the Bismarcks it has a whole load of additional implications because if the Germans don't build the Scharnhorst the French may not feel so compelled to build the Richelieu's um, they wouldn't feel so compelled to upgrade Strasbourg either. If they don't do that, then the Italians maybe don't build quite as many Littorios as they ended up building. And if the British are looking at things and going, well, the Germans aren't building any modern battleships, the biggest surface combatant they've got is either a Hipper or a Deutschland, depending on if you go by displacement or guns, well, then the British emphasis on how they're spending their resources is going to change. They're probably still going to build the King George V, um, to be perfectly honest, but when they're looking out at the what, because they've got to look at Italy and they've got to look at Japan, but if they're looking out at a situation where Germany is suddenly cranking out U-boats left, right and centre, well, then the British are going to put a lot more emphasis into building up their anti-submarine warfare divisions, which is going to then have another effect, obviously, because if the Cruise Marina launches out with the, the war with their 300 U-boats, well, if the British now have a lot more anti-submarine warfare um, shipping available to them, well, that's going to change things again. Would the increased British anti-submarine warfare component be able to hold off the greater tide of Kriegsmarine U-boats? Or not, who knows? But it's a lot more complex when we're talking about things realistically than just arbitrarily increasing the number of units on one side and, and not increasing on the other. Because, yes, in theory, if you just magicked up the Kriegsmarine's U-boat arm to 300 at the start of the war, that's not going to go well for Britain. Um, I haven't done very detailed analysis to work out whether or not they'd be able to start them out, but it's a possibility. But at that point, when you're just magically hand-waving stuff into existence without any allowing for any realistic response by the other side, then, you know, it, it's about the same level of usefulness in terms of a historical context as, well, what if the Japanese had, you know, triple the number of aircraft carriers at Pearl Harbor? Or, you know, what if um, the, what if the French had nuclear weapons in 1939 or something like that? It's like, well interesting to a degree but not historically useful patrick donnelly asks how applicable would u.s navy carrier doctrine tactics and strategies and so forth from the 1944 to 45 era be in the 1942 carrier battles given the limits of technology and equipment from that year the overarching ideas encapsulated in late war u.s carrier doctrine would fit 42 carrier doctrine relatively well but a lot of the finer details wouldn't because, for example, um, the US by the mid to late part of the war was grouping all of its carriers together as opposed to acting with them all in independent little packets because they'd learned that that was the best way to defend their ships, which was true. Assuming that you had a lot of anti-aircraft firepower that you could bring to bear, you had VT fuses and you had decent combat air patrol, which was directed by radio and fire radar that's not something the 1942 carrier divisions have so if you i mean much as operating carriers together is much better from a strike perspective and in theory from a defensive perspective there is a certain amount to be said for the u.s pre-war assumption that a carrier that's detected is a carrier that's lost and if you put all the carriers together you might lose them all at once because that's exactly what happened to the japanese at midway um despite the theoretical greater concentration of defensive fire and combat air patrol, whereas with the US, if you found one carrier, you found one carrier. So they found Yorktown, but they didn't find uh, Enterprise or Hornet with that particular strike, for example. 
And given the fact you don't have VT fuses, you don't have the proliferation of 20 and 40 millimeter, you don't have the proliferation of anti-aircraft radar guided fire control, you don't have as many 5-inch guns aboard various ships or as many ships as you did in 44-45, then perhaps clustering, say, the three carriers at uh, midway together or the two to three vessels that were available at any given point um, usually, well, for the two main battles, two at Guadalcanal, um, clustering them all together very closely may not necessarily have been quite this, as as good an idea. Um, you know, you don't have the fighter control direction, for example. They're experimenting with it at Guadalcanal, but it's not really that good. It takes the visit of HMS Victorious to really get that on the right track. And, of course, U.S. carrier doctrine in the later war can make certain assumptions about the numbers of aircraft that are available and their overall survivability, like you know, the Avengers being able to drop their torpedoes from further out and whilst going faster, which the Devastators and then the early Avengers in 42, they can't physically do that because that technology hasn't been invented yet, and the U.S. has far fewer carriers and far fewer aircraft to go with. So... As I said, the, the broad strategy would be still mostly applicable in terms of how to locate your enemy and what you should do when you find your enemy, how to plan strikes, etc. But a lot of the fine detail of U.S. carrier doctrine in the latter part of the war either relies on certain assumptions based on what they have that they don't have in 42, uh, or relies on technologies that have been significantly improved since 42, or relies on capabilities that the US Navy has developed since 42 and those underpin what the the tactics are in the latter part of the war which is is a slightly weird concept in some ways because of course by 44 45 you're only two to three years apart from the carrier battles of 1942 but they are entirely different things based on a lot of very very different assumptions and capabilities Trevor Polasek asks, what are the advantages of welding versus riveting, particularly for naval vessels? So compared to riveting, welding does have a number of advantages. Uh, for one thing, it means the ship saves a lot of weight. Uh, you can look at some of the British cruisers during the early 1930s, like the Leanders, and you can see that as more and more welding is used in various ships as you get further and further along in the class, their weight at launch drops quite significantly and that's because with welding you put the two plates you're joining together next to each other perhaps with some kind of backing plate behind the joint and you weld them together whereas with riveting you have to either have the two plates overlap or you have to introduce some fairly hefty overlapping plates in front and or behind all of which adds to additional weight for the ship, plus, of course, the rivets themselves uh, are additionally heavier. Also, welding is completely watertight if done properly. A riveted joint technically is not if it starts to work itself, which, of course, in uh, sea state it probably will. You also have to take into account that the individual rivets, or more precisely the holes that are drilled for the rivets, are points where stress fractures can start and it takes quite a while to do the riveting um, which of course is going to extend the ship's build time welding can be done significantly faster and it also leads to a smoother surface which when you're talking about a ship that's hundreds of feet long well you can flush the rivets down but even if you do which to be fair they usually didn't um, a completely smooth welded hull is going to be much better hydrodynamically than a riveted hull now there are some disadvantages you know if a weld fails that crack will probably be significantly longer than if a single rivet joint pops um, you also have the fact that welding generally requires a more skilled workforce. That's not to say you don't need to be relatively skilled to do riveting, but if you think in terms of skill ceilings and skill floors, the skill floor to become a basic riveter is significantly lower than the skill floor to become a basic welder if you want both parties' work to actually stand up to the basics of the conditions it's designed to be. Um, additionally, once you've welded two sections of hull together 
they are pretty much joined. Getting them apart or cutting out a section to repair battle damage is going to be quite difficult, whereas with rivets you can just shear the rivet heads off and in theory just remove the affected plate. And the other advantage, which can be quite important depending on which part of the ship you're in, is that riveting can be used to join together all sorts of metals, whereas trying to weld, say, a brass plate or a brass piece of equipment to a steel plate is going to be, uh, let's just say, a little difficult. And so this is why, as welding came in, it was used selectively at first and then more and more broadly. But even on ships that were primarily put together using welding, there are still going to be some areas where riveting is used. Brian Smith asks, There are two ships that had an unsuccessful first voyage, Titanic and Bismarck. Why do you think these two ships get so much attention after they both sank and could both be considered failures? I think the reason for the attention is very different in each case. Titanic gets attention because it was hyped up beforehand. Um, obviously, you know, people are like, oh, yes, God himself could not sink this ship, etc., etc. It was kind of supposed to be the last word, the expression of man's triumph over nature, and then nature ripped its hull open and sent it to the bottom in a matter of hours on its first voyage which you know that juxtaposition was quite powerful especially back then and obviously the huge loss of life as well um as i mentioned earlier that it had a huge impact on people because well even if a ocean liner went down with all hands 10 years prior they just physically weren't as large so they physically couldn't carry quite as many people so I think that is a kind of the the hubris and the build up of Titanic combined with its uh, rather dramatic failure kind of created this legend which has persisted to this day because realistically speaking in terms of major maritime disasters involving large passenger carrying vessels you really have to look for wartime heavily packed uh, liners and so forth that have been overstuffed with people to find higher casualty counts for the most part. Bismarck, I think, gets attention partly, to be fair, as a result of British propaganda and Allied propaganda in general hyping up Bismarck during the Second World War to a, you know, a position she doesn't really actually occupy. Plus, of course, the destruction of Hood, which had a big effect in the UK. And, you know, there's also, I guess, the rarity value. People obsess over things when there's only a few of them, as opposed to when there's loads and loads and loads of them. Yamato arguably has a better claim to people obsessing over because she was so large, but one of the other reasons is there's only Yamato and Musashi. With Bismarck, in terms of full-scale battleships, you only have Bismarck and Tirpitz for World War II battleships in Germany, whereas obviously Britain and America have quite a few. Um, so th there's the rarity factor that comes in as well. And then combine that with these, at times, slightly obsessive, borderline cult-like obsession with German equipment and its supposed efficiency that has grown up for various reasons in the aftermath of World War II and Bismarck being a socking great massive example of German engineering people kind of lock onto it now as I said as I've said before Bismarck is not terrible it's horrifically inefficient as a design but it's still broadly comparable in fighting power with the admittedly much smaller treaty battleships that are its contemporaries but nonetheless it, it does definitely get overblown um significantly more than it should by all other rights do now as far as could they be considered failures uh, bismarck yeah pretty much i mean the best case interpretation of bismarck is it traded one v one for one in terms of large 15 inch armed capital ships which when you're germany and you only ever built a pair of full-scale battleships and the British have over a dozen, that's not a trade you want to make, really. Um, it's like the, uh, Yes, the British would prefer not to lose Hood, but if the choice was you lose Hood and, let's say, Repulse, and in exchange the Germans lose Bismarck and Tirpitz, the British are going to okay, uh, we'd rather not lose that many men, but we can live with that, because we have a dozen plus other capital ships we can use, and the Germans will be down to zero. Um debates about Scharnhorst aside and ultimately you know neither of the Bismarcks 
achieved much of anything other than tying down a bunch of resources. So I guess maybe you could analyze them in terms of you know, resources tied down versus overall effect. But in that case, the winner of the two is probably going to be Tirpitz rather than Bismarck. So yes, ultimately Bismarck failed in the purposes for which it was built and designed. Titanic, well, it sank. So yes, Titanic in and of itself was a failure. Um, it's failed to stay afloat. The Olympic class in general, though, are a little bit odd. I mean, as has been reviewed by a number of people at various stages, if Titanic had actually headlined the iceberg, you know, just rammed it straight on, albeit with its engines on full reverse, it probably would have survived. Um, it may have still have sunk, but it would have taken a lot longer. Um, you know, it, it, whether or not it sinks or it survives would depend very much on what the final speed impact was etc and a whole bunch of other factors but certainly there would be a lot more survivors uh, but britannic obviously sank was sunk in world war one but olympic had a relatively decent career albeit it did have a habit of either hitting things or being hit by things which didn't really help but as ocean liners the olympic class in general probably a qualified success titanic aside because you know, wartime is wartime Conled asks, at what point did the British realise that the US could outbuild them? And at what point did it become clear that that would absolutely happen? Did this impact British plans and foreign policy in any way? Broadly speaking, around about the early 1920s would be when it became clear it could happen. And then the 1930s would be when it became clear that it would happen. And well late 30s early 40s i guess and the reason for though that is that in the early 1920s obviously britain still has the infrastructure and the industry in terms of gun manufacture armor manufacture boiler manufacturing shipyards slipways etc albeit some of them could probably use with a bit of a size upgrade but you know collectively in terms of naval stuff because the size upgrade mostly affects battleships and uh, battle cruisers and carriers the smaller stuff less so but you know in the 1920s britain still has the naval infrastructure to compete with the u.s in a building competition and potentially even outbuild it um, if especially if they upgrade some of the larger slipways so that they can build more of the larger ships but whilst they physically have the capability of doing so they do not have the money to do so because of the war debts incurred uh, in World War I and the loss of life. Now, that's not to say that they couldn't afford the G3s and the N3s. They physically could, as I pointed out in the past. Um, but it's a matter of priorities. Where do you want the money to go? Not whether or not you have the money, period. So, in extremis, if... If push comes to shove and the British are forced by whatever reason to get into a building war in the 1920s, they do physically have the industrial capacity to compete with or outbuild the US, but they don't have the financial resources to do so. Which is why, in terms of impact on plans and foreign policy, the British accept the Washington Naval Treaty, because they absolutely do not want uh, to lose their primacy as a naval power, but it's very clear that the choice is accept the Washington Treaty and you lose primacy to being the joint largest navy in the world alongside the US, or you don't accept the treaty, there's a naval arms race, and you may retain your position as the largest navy in the world, but it's also entirely possible you might lose it because you are going to end up facing someone who has an awful lot more money than you do. And at that point, they can afford to build more than you can, even if, as I said, the shipyard capacities are a different story. Then when you fast forward that into the late 30s and you have the rebuilding going on uh, in the aftermath of the collapse of the treaty system, well, at that point, British shipbuilding industry has atrophied quite considerably and Britain still while it has more money than it did in the early 20s, doesn't have as much money as they'd like. And the US, on the other hand, Great Depression aside, its economy has grown quite considerably. It's retained a little bit more of its industry, and because it has more money, it's able to restart and build up 
its naval infrastructure a lot more quickly. So in the late 30s, it's very clear that the US absolutely can outbuild the British because the one thing the British had in the 20s, which was the, the larger naval industry, has gone away. And you broadly see this plan if in that the British go from you know the 1900s to the 1910s. Yeah, we can fight the US at sea if we want to. This sucks about Canada, but we can beat them in a naval war. To the 1920s of we might be able to, but we'd, we'd go bankrupt doing so. Um, and there's no necessary guarantee that we can because we might run out of money ahead of actually you know, beating them at sea. To the 1930s where they've gone from you know, we are able to safeguard the empire against all threats to we're able to safeguard the empire against Japan or Germany or Italy, um, but we're just going to assume that as long as the Americans play in their sphere and we kind of leave them alone in that, that they'll leave us alone in our sphere and hope it really doesn't come down to anything worse than that. Richard Goss asks, Vanguard was decommissioned because a town or county was thought to be able to defeat a Sverdlov. Do you think this was reasonable? The Russian cruisers would surely have been more capable, and shouldn't Vanguard therefore have been kept? Well, overall, when Vanguard was initially sent into reserve before, well, it was a reserve she'd never come out of, it was stated by the Admiralty that essentially it, the, the cost in terms of manpower and money to keep Vanguard operational was the, about the same as keeping any two cruisers in service. And they thought, yeah, well, to two town class or a town and a crown colony or whatever combination, that'll be fine for taking on Sverdlovs in a straight up gunfight and various other duties. Um, it was, to my mind, given the stated purpose uh, and various other things, it was a thoroughly stupid decision. Because, yes, technically on paper, especially with Western technology, at least something like Belfast, the largest of the towns, would be a little bit superior to a Sverdlov. So if you put a Sverdlov up against Belfast after her 1950s refit, I'd put money on Belfast, but she's not going to be coming out of it completely intact. A Crown Colony or one of the other towns that's dropped one of its triple six-inch I'd be a little bit more hesitant at that stage. Um, whereas, of course, if Vanguard comes across a Sverdlov, Vanguard's going to blow the thing clean out of the water uh, with minimal damage to itself. Whereas, obviously, even if Belfast comes across two Sverdlovs, and let's face it, the uh, Soviets did build quite a number of them, I, I, Belfast isn't going to win against two Sverdlovs, not unless she gets extremely lucky. Whereas Vanguard, if two Sverdlovs show up, is most likely just going to be going, hmm, um, where's the nearest able seaman? Tell him to go down to the paint shop and get out the uh, kill marker paint, because we're going to need it. <laughs> and when you look at the gradual, if you to quote the um, yes, Prime Minister, the salami slicing that was done to get rid of Vanguard, you can see it's a typical British political bodge job. Um obviously putting pressure on the Navy as well. And to be fair, there are certain elements in the higher echelons of the Navy that were agreeing with them. Uh, but effectively, at first, it's, oh, no, well, you know, two town class can do the same job as Vanguard. And Vanguard does have a, a valuable role. But in peacetime, to meet our peacetime commitments, Vanguard should be in a high status reserve to reduce costs. And we'll, we'll keep the cruisers around. So it's, OK, bearing in mind a Navy is a war fighting operation, you are admitting that you are considerably cutting down the Navy's ability to fight an actual war in exchange for what? Using a bunch of fairly large and still by your own admission expensive to run cruisers to do flag showing or build a couple of frigates or some destroyers to do that instead, you muppet. Um, and then once it's in reserve, it's like, ah, oh, yes, well, you know, there is in reserve, it's um, it costing a lot of money to keep it in high status ready reserve. So uh, we're going to have to downgrade its reserve status. And then once it's been downgraded, it's well, it's going to take ages to get it back in service if we need it. And, you know, a war could break out tomorrow and then we wouldn't have the ship ready in time. So do we really need it? I suppose we could maybe use it for training and so forth and just have it hanging around for a bit. But, you know, let's spend even less money on it. And then it's, oh, well, you know, it's it, we'd have to refit it completely and it would take... <sighs> 
months to get crew back on board and get it back into operational service. And, you know, without the refits and the updates, it would lag behind anyway. And so, you know, it's much better that we just get rid of it completely now. It It's fairly obvious that's what certain elements of the higher echelons of British political structures wanted to do from the start. Um, and they just worked out that if they straight up tried to scrap it from active service, they'd reach too much resistance. All things considered, if it costs as much to run a pair of cruisers as it does to run a single battleship, then, to be perfectly honest, looking at the Royal Navy's forces in the 50s and 60s, you might as well have kept Vanguard around. She offered, obviously, far more volume and space to potentially carry upgrades, missile systems, radar, etc., etc. Yes, she couldn't be in two places at once, but you know, this is Cold War Britain with a series of increasingly stupid governments. The fact that you have two town class or derivatives around, one of them's probably been stuck in reserve anyway and is cycling with the other one, so realistically, you can still only in one place at once. If it comes down to surface combat, Vanguard is infinitely superior to a town class or derivative. And also, pretty much all of the cruisers that Royal Navy has have shorter life expectancies on them because they've all been involved to varying degrees in World War II, where they've been run pretty hard. Vanguard hasn't. Vanguard was brought into commission just after World War II, so she's got a lot longer lifespan on her anyway. Plus, you need command and control facilities, you need helicopter facilities, you need the ability to lead a fleet... Well, you can do that from Vanguard a lot easier than you can do from Butchering Tiger and Blake, for example. So, you know, pretty much all of the arguments that were made by various political figures in the 50s and early 60s to get rid of Vanguard don't actually really stand up to scrutiny because the arguments that they're making are even less well served by the ships Vanguard is being scrapped to ostensibly preserve. Because bearing in mind, Belfast is a relatively capable ship, but she's also the largest and most capable of her family. All the other towns and crown colonies are significantly less capable than she is. But then again, it's not exactly like the higher echelons usually make the right call anyway. And with that, we come to the end of Dry Dock episode 230. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And there will be a community post and an update to the website going up at the time that you're listening to this, which will detail in more uh, detail, well, that's a bit redundant, but nevertheless, you get the idea of what's happening with the February US trip. So have a look out for that um, and hope to see a few of you around. <laughs>